ಏಕಂ ಸತ್ ವಿಪ್ರ ಬಹುದಾ ವದಂತಿ ಬಹು ಜನ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಲರ್ನ್ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಆರ್ ಎಸ್ಟೀಮ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ದಿ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಆಫ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಜಾನ್ ಲಾಕ್ ಸೇಸ್ ಐಡಿಯಾ ಇಸ್ ದಟ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ serves best to stand for whatsoever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks that way religion culture custom country etc are as much ideas as physical forms that is why like all the alluring gadgets and games humans create they are very powerful enough to pull us into their vortex to the extent of losing our own rational mind and reasoning faculty any idea can be a dream aspired by positive people let us say prabuddha bharat enlightened india ideas can also be highly reactionary divisive and violent like india belongs only to certain sections and others have to fall in line or condemned to be second class citizens in this light what is the idea of india in the realm of ideas and what we see in reality is it the land of great sages who espoused sarve bhavantu sukhinaha or is it the land where the worst form of untouchability is a religious credo is it a land where women is worshiped as shakti or is it the land where satis were burnt alive and now of child brides dowry deaths gang rapes at all is it a tantalizingly tolerant land or is it in the clutches of cruel conflicts is it the exporter of software and ceos or transporter of packages of poor people as chattel is it a kaleidoscope of colors bright and bleached or is it as bloody as the scarves we wear and the flags we fly with colors of sacrifice and revolution is it the beginningless and endless sanatan land or is it ever changing ever progressing lively land of faith hope and love what we invoked at the outset ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti the truth is one though the wise call it by many names Plato seems to claim a thousand years after the Rigveda when he says that there is a realm of ideas forms which exist independently of anyone who may have thoughts on these ideas and it is the ideas which distinguish mere opinion from knowledge for unlike material things which are transient and liable to contrary properties ideas are unchanging and nothing but just what they are what should be the unchanging idea of india the two eminent speakers see two ideas of india which are in fact two eyes of the same vision while professor aruna rai sees the constitution as the idea of india professor hargopal fancies humane india is the idea of india in the first part of the webinar the speakers speak 20 minutes each or so or as the deem fit and then question and answer session of 20 minutes or so follows kindly post your questions in the chat box on the top right corner one of our colleagues will facilitate to begin with professor aruna roy professor roy is a socio political activist and founder member Majdur Kisan Sakti Sanghatan, MKSS, National Campaign to People's Right to Information, NCPRI, and the School for Democracy, SFD. She was with the IAS from 1968 to 1975. In 1975, she came to Ajmer district in Rajasthan to work with the SWRC and the Rural Pro. In 1987, she moved to live with the poor in devadungri village rajasaman district in rajasthan in 1990 she was part of the group that set up the mkss 
She has worked for accessing constitutional rights for the poor, right to information, employment, food security, etc. She was a member of the National Advisory Council from 2004 to 2006, and again from 2010 to 2013. She was a member of the steering committee of the Open Government Partnership till 2014, and she is currently the council member of Progressive International. She is president of the National Federation of Indian Women, NFIW. She was the 2016 professor of practice at McGill University, ISID, Montreal, Canada, and the 2016 George Soros Visiting Practitioner Chair in CEU Budapest. Her awards include the Raymond Magsaysay Award in 2000, the Nani Falkiwala Award, and the Lal Badur Shastri National Award. She was listed as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by the Time magazine for 2011. Oh, such an illustrious professor, Aruna will speak on the constitution as the idea of India. Our constitution is one of the greatest scriptures that India's collective consciousness has ever produced. Sir Ernest Barker, a distinguished English political scientist was so moved by its preamble that he inscribed it on the opening page of his treatise, Principles of Social and Political Theory, published in 1951. Saying fraternity is the best bet for democratic society, Dr. Ambedkar says, caution, or rather he cautions us, constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to learn it. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. Professor Roy will tell us how the constitution as the idea of India binds all of us. We are Indians first and we are Indians last. It is the need of the hour as divisive forces posing as nationalists are playing havoc with the very soul of India itself. Over to you, ma'am, Professor Arunara. Thank you very much to Anik Dara for inviting me to share my views. Let me begin at the uh, outset by saying that I dedicate whatever I say today, particularly as I heard so much Telugu being spoken to Mr. Esar Shankaran, who is a mutual friend of Professor Hargopal and mine, and who, in my opinion, with all the limitations of being a civil servant lived the constitution. So for me, uh, I really, in one sense, dedicate whatever I say to Mr. Shankaran. I also want to uh, request you to please drop the professor. I am in what I call a fraud professor. I have just got honorary doctors, which are meaningless. And I am essentially a simple activist and a worker for the poor and with the poor. And Mazur uh, Kisan Shakti Sangatan, which is the MKSS, is a non-party political organization where we all draw minimum wages. And we have lived like, like the people around us in a mud hut, and we continue to do so. And it's there that I've learned and unlearned my real political philosophy and my understanding of many things. And it's been a progressive process of education through the Indian Civil Service through working with an NGO, through working with women's groups, through working with human rights groups, and a learning from people like Professor Hargopal and many others who I visited in Andhra uh, when I stayed with Mr. Shankaran after he retired and learned so many things. So it's a process of long learning and sharing and understanding that common sense and wisdom is the most important thing in life. The idea of India is in the Indian constitution for the very simple reason that when we gained independence, which was post a very bloody partition. And at that time, the concept of a new India and the rejoicing for promised freedom, which was achieved from getting rid of an imperial power was shadowed largely by the, uh, the fears of the of the 
the practicality of an India in which religion still dominated, in which prejudice and discrimination were still forces that had to be reckoned with, in which violence, despite Gandhi's great role in getting us independence with non-violence, emerged as a force where on the day of independence, Gandhi was sitting in Bengal and in Naukhali arguing for peace and not for killing. It was with on this very murky uh, political substance of, of peace, of, of non-violence, of an argument for peace that the new India was born. So when India celebrated its independence, it also anticipated a lot of problems from what emerged as the new nation state. So at that point, it was absolutely clear that clear that ideological positions, no matter what their clarity was, would be overcome by religious and caste tensions. And there was no way in which we would be able to get ideology uh, rule over the inherent drawbacks of an Indian state. Actually, as the constitution was framed and as uh, it was presented to the Indian government, there were two very important state, state statements made by two very diverse people. Uh, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan, he was to become our vice president, warned us, and I quote him. He said that our national faults of character, our domestic despotism, our intolerance, which have assumed different forms of obscurantism, are of narrow-mindedness, of superstitious bigotry are to be really fought against. He continued to say, our opportunities are great, but let me tell you that when power outstrips ability, we will fall on evil days. Baba Sahib, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar had always had reservations about how democracy would work out. He envisioned the perils of sectarian divisions. He said in the same assembly, will Indians place the country above their creed? or will they place the creed above their country? I do not know. But this much is certain that if the political parties place creed above country, our independence will be put in jeopardy a second time and probably be lost forever. Ever. This eventuality we must all resolutely guard against. The Indian constitution was in one way, an effort to resolve these conflicts and put together a structure of India and a dream of India so that we could work towards it structurally and in practical terms to reach our goals. I would say that the most important gift of constitutional India to us is the definition of it as a secular country. Following the partition, following the various horrible uh, butcher, butchering that took place on both sides of the border, and I was born one year before independence and I lived in Delhi as a child and I still have emotive memories of the pain and anguish it caused everybody. Followed by the an assassination of Mahatma Gandhi because of his uh, cultural plurality, his religious plurality and his acceptance of all religions. India really needed a definition of itself as a secular country. And I think one of the most significant contributions of the constitution has been its definition of ourselves as a secular country. And it's also one of its greatest problems today that, and I hope Professor Hargopal will talk about the problems when he speaks, it's a threat to secularism from the kind of new political philosophies that are emerging and the new kind of governments that we are framing and the new political discourses we are fashioning, which are all threatening the concept of a secular India. It begins in one sense with a complete lack of understanding of political history. As I sit and talk to you from a village, I can tell you that we have not really looked at political edu education as a continuum. Some of the left parties definitely saw political education as a continuum, but they have now become very weak. And the right has constantly filled everybody's head with a discourse which is politically inaccurate, inaccurate and historically incorrect. But the result is that those of us who are in these political formations outside political parties have tried very hard to set right this complete discrepancy between truth and reality, uh, truth, reality, and the discourse in our years of work with people. 
But we also haven't understood that like literacy, which is a, that every generation has to go through its literacy training. We can't say because the grandmother knew her alphabets, the grandchild will know the alphabets. We went through the alphabets. We went through each subject. Similarly, we have failed to politically educate our youth who do not have any history. There's a blank. So it's partly the fault of my generation and the generation, generation after me that we did not think it was necessary to continue with the political education outside of school. We put things into the school curriculum, but the school teachers who taught the curriculum were themselves either party to a different ideology or were completely incompetent. With the result that you still do not know pe people in my area, and I'm sure in large parts of India, do not know that, the, uh, that for instance, that Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi and the Gandhis, Indira Gandhi and family are not related. Simple as that. I mean, and you can ask anywhere. You can go and just ask the question and they think all Gandhis are related and that it is a continuation of Mahatma Gandhi's lineage that the, the, the Indira Gandhi family not linking it to Jawaharlal Nehru. So I feel that I'm talking of a very mundane level, but I really feel that it gave us the concept of a secular India, which was vital for India to forge its way with the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia living in this in this in this uh, land space that we call India, it was critically important that we look at India as a secular place. We also boast of Saint Thomas, Apostle of Christ, landing on the coast of Kerala, and therefore it was important that we also cherish the idea of India being a space where multiple religions could land and where they were persecuted elsewhere, the leaders could land and continue with their ideas and ideologies, whether it was the Parsis or whether it was St. Thomas the Apostle or whether it was new religions, there was ample space for difference and dissent, which was built into the idea of India. The second important idea was an equal India. We are a completely caste-ridden and divisive and hierarchical society. It's in the blood of Indians, no matter what religion they belong to, unfortunately, that caste dominates over everything else. So the first question you get asked when you go to any village, and especially a Rajasthani village, is not your name, not where you come from, not what you're doing here, but what is your caste? And I was shocked when I came here in 1975 from urban India to find that caste is absolutely the predominant identity of an individual, and then comes the rest. So in an equal India where women are looked at in a very pejorative way, where in Rajasthan women were wearing parda, they couldn't disclose, they couldn't show, throw up the parda and show their faces, they couldn't talk loudly, they couldn't participate. This was 1975 in Rajasthan. But anyway, things have changed dramatically in Rajasthan. We have now fought many battles and women are at the forefront. We fought the Sati battle and we fought the rape battles, we fought many other battles, and also the battle of women in the workplace. And we've got legislations in two areas in place because of our struggles. But the point is, it was a Rajasthan which was where women also continued to be second, second and second rate, third rate citizens, actually. So an equal India was critically important. The third thing it gave us, and that is where I feel most people don't even look at the Constitution seriously, is that it, it gave the space for a welfare state. It was critically important again for an India that it should look at poverty. And I won't go into figures, but the poverty in India was phenomenal at the time of the independence. Illiteracy was very high. There were so many battles to be fought. So it was not just independence from, for, from an imperial, imperial uh, domination of an imperial nation like England, but it was also a desire for real freedom from hunger, from conflict, for real freedom from uh, poverty, real freedom from lack of education, lack of health, real freedom where the government would look at people as part of their obligated mandate to bring some kind of equality in these in this in socio-economic terms. And for that, there was a there was a in, attempt made to form this as a part of the constitution and the directive principles of state policy. And I, in fact, work within that entire paradigm, because if I don't work within that paradigm, I have no leg I have no legitimacy. I work within the paradigm of the directive principles of state policy. Unfortunately, not justiciable, but where it defines the 
process by which or the direction by which all these inequalities can be reduced. It is a process still to be fulfilled in its entirety, despite a welfare state which ran till a few years ago. From the last few years, about seven or eight years, we have ceased to be even in name a welfare state. Let me tell you a very some quickly a few examples, and I will proceed to the next issue. The five-year plans, for instance, the five-year plans were a way of sharing with the nation what the government intended to do with our money and our allocations and our plans and how it it, it proceed it would proceed to take our condition of socio-economic imbalance to a better state of balance. But it has not. It has been. It is the planning commission doesn't exist. So in its place, we have a Niti Aayog. What it does to us, we do not know, but what it has done through legislations, we know. It has brought in all kinds of, it has demonetized. It has brought in the, uh, the uh, funds for electoral parties. It has brought in uh, all kinds of other issues which we do not want, which do not help the poor. It has brought in rank unemployment. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I'll draw your attention to the Oxfam Annual Inequality Report 2022. According to that, the India supplement of the report tells us that to 2021 to 20,000, how much, how many crores is it? 2021.84% of households have lost their income. There's been a drop. The number of billionaires, however, has grown from 102 to 142 billionaires. Though COVID has continued to ravage this country, India's new healthcare budget has seen a 10% decline in the revised estimates of last year. There was a 6% cut in alloc allocation for education and social security schemes allocation has declined. We also know that the wealth of the Indian billionaires has increased to 14 lakh crores and it's been much more than doubled. The increased wealth of these Indian billionaires is could have funded MGNREGA for 30 years, but it's, they will say that there is no money. So according to the Oxfam report, which I've just mildly touched on, and which is based on facts, the disparity between the rich and the poor has grossly been grossly expended, expanded and exaggerated in the modern, in the modern scenario. And if you look at the budget of the central government that came out a few days ago, it's an anti-poor budget. There is no mention of services for the poor. And I would like you to know that for pensions, for an old age pension, which is also not a universal pension, but a targeted pension, a worker who has worked all her life building this new country gets 200 rupees a month if she gets it. 200 rupees, it's a, it's a laugh. What can you get in 200 rupees? So the government of India has not revised its pension. If we get better pensions, it's because state governments have added to that pension and there's a, there's a marginal increase. So I would like to share with you the role of people like me, who are called civil society activists, who are called uh, Andolan GVs, who are called urban nuxials, who are called any number of names today, that we people are fighting for the constitution and actually it's we who feel the need for the constitution and its provisions, because those who enjoy impunity are not going to ask for revision of policy. They are not going to ask for, they are going to ask for a revision of the constitution. They're going to ask for more money in the private sector. But for those of us who benefit from the constitution and for whom the constitution was framed for the idea of India, for the idea of humane India, which Professor Hargopal is going to speak and for for a better India, we certainly need a constitution and the constitutional values and the principles to prevail. Uh, currently, the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangratan, which also was primary in its campaigning for the right to information law, was a very important participant of the Mandrega law and the food security law. MKSS has also published a book called the... Uh, the uh, hmm? The RTI story, I have a friend sitting next to me who's prompting me, the RTI story, which has been published, which tells you how ordinary people have given you the RTI. 
please don't be under the illusion that it's come from any policy debate or any uh, civil society, upper middle class people like me. It's been ordinary people who've given it to you. So I'd like to quickly show a small little uh, clip, but while they're getting ready to show the clip, let me say that we are now in struggle, MKSS, and with the Sushna Rozgar Abhyan, a, 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 an organization of 150 other organizations, we are struggling for an accountability. accountability. We have fought and gone on yatras. So we have collected money and we all crowdfunded. All our campaigns are crowdfunded. We don't take money from any foundations. With crowdfunding, we have visited 14 districts. We have, we have collected over a lakh and 50,000 in donations of three and five rupees. And the government of Rajasthan in its budget announcement five days ago said it would give us a right accountability law and pass it immediately. But till they pass the law, we're sitting in Dharna in Jaipur. I am here partially because it's close to Jaipur and I'm here to speak to you, but the Dharna is on and I'll give show you a small clip of the Dharna to show you how the constitution and the dream of a better India is steadily kept alive by the people whom we damn for everything. Call them parasites on society, call them economic drain on the on the on the on the, in, on the country's economy. I'd like to show you a small script. All right. Meanwhile, while you're trying, the right to information law, which is used by about eight, 80 lakh people every year, 80 lakh applications every year, has still not made the government deliver in full, in full term, in a, in a complete way. Just lately in Barmer, one RTI seeker was beaten so badly by the Panchayat Sarpanch and by his goons. His, both his legs have been fractured and they are saying that if one leg doesn't improve, they'll have to amputate him. So those who seek information and seek integrity in public, public life are now victims and over 100 RTI users have been. So this accountability law is critically important so that when we uncover corruption, uncover abuse of power, then there is some action taken against those people who do these acts. So the accountability law is to ensure that when transparency happens and we know that people are making mistakes within the system, that they are rectified. The secretary to a government, to the government of Rajasthan has talked to the collector of this particular district so that the they will be there, so that the culprits will be apprehended until today, two months later, the culprits have not been arrested. So where do we go and to whom do we ask for justice? So this, uh, is, this is the reason why we need an accountability law. We are really indebted to ma'am for uh, bringing uh, such a wonderful uh, way how the constitution as our ideal, as our dream, in fact, our very life itself. As uh, the first uh, vice president, Professor Radha Krishnan and the chief architect, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, both they have put how the obscurantic, see from the one extreme to the other extreme, how one uh, uh, intellectual said how we have to fight the forces of obscurant obscurantism. And on the other side, the chief architect is worrying about, uh, will we lose our freedom again? Really very, very important aspects. Thanks a lot, mom, for bringing such a, a great thing. Now, if the constitution is humane and our very legacy is humane, as we claim our great land, how this thing will uh, in the practice? My colleague, uh, Ms. Pranil Pavitran will introduce Professor Hargopal. Uh, I invite Pavitran to take over. Good morning. It is my privilege indeed to invite Mr. Hargopal, Professor Hargopal, who in fact needs no introduction as a professor of long standing of political science, as well as an activist in the human rights field. I hand over to Professor Hargopal for further elaboration of his ideas. Uh, friends, I think I uh, <clears throat> also thank uh, the organizers, uh, partly giving us this opportunity of sharing some of our concerns. And uh, doubly thank them for, uh, you know, having Aruna 
uh, in this uh, series uh, where I also uh, got the opportunity of listening to her. And uh, I am a great uh, admirer of uh, the way, you know, Arna works. Uh, I am not exaggerating. Uh, she has been one of the sources of uh, uh, inspiration uh, for me as an individual. And since she referred to Shankaran, uh, Shankaran also had such an appreciation for her work. I think Arna would recall that her last visit to Hyderabad, of course she used to stay with him, but at that time, for some reason, she chose to stay outside and Shankaran was upset. She said, look, Arna has not come this time to stay with me. Uh, he, he was upset because he was trying to find out the reason why she uh, hasn't come because that, that's how he uh, was, you know, he felt attached to her. Uh, of course, uh, three persons who used to stay with him was Harshmandar, uh, our B.D. Sharma, and uh, of course, Aruna. These three, whenever they came to Hyderabad, but they would stay with Shankaran. And uh, when I talk of a humane uh, India, I have uh, some people like uh, Shankaran as a reference point. That how he humanized himself at a level where uh, persons uh, working with him can't believe that a person can live that way. The way he lived. Uh, because I was a everyday witness to his uh, uh, you know, life, uh, not when he was in the office, but particularly after he superannuated. And since almost 10 years, I worked with him in the Committee of Concerned Citizens. And when we were to write the reports, three reports which we prepared, uh, both of us uh, used to work and this was a great opportunity. But the humanism of a very rare kind, how a human being evolves, to a level uh, no, of Shankaran. But Shankaran will say that, you know, no, see, uh, this is all very simple. Anybody can do this. And he believed that this is possible for everybody. And uh, he always said that I have not done anything. But then, you know, of course, he was, uh, I always felt that a new human being or a new society, uh, you know, I mean, when you imagine, uh, perhaps these are not uh, these are the future human beings. If a, if humanity evolves and uh, it moves to a higher level, which uh, all of us believe it will, uh, I think uh, people like Shankaran belong to that uh, you know future. And uh, but they were uh, with us very much and uh, surprising us that human beings can evolve to that level. Nothing personal, nothing private. Everything is uh, public. Everything is collective. Uh, and um, he would be extremely happy if uh, something good happens in anywhere in this was in, in India. And you know he would be very unhappy if something is happening. But his life was uh, passing through these emotions uh, with uh, nothing to do with his personal life. Nothing to do with his personal life. At a personal level, he was a very happy man it, uh, I mean, as, a, as far as this person is concerned. But the society around uh, no, um, it was something uh, was his concern. He, he had always that concern. So we in uh, Telangana or in the combined state had some people around us, whether it's the Kanabiran, whether it's the Balgopal, whether it's the Tarakam, whether it's the Karloji, you know, I mean, uh, Jay Shankar. Uh, we had a large number of people around us uh, who were uh, to a large extent uh, living for others. But then we are living in a society which is uh, hierarchical, authoritarian, uh, uh, democratic, they, as, as far as society is concerned. And Aruna spoke about constitution. In fact, the makers of the constitution, particularly Dr. Ambedkar, they thought that the Indian state would, would contribute to the transformation of the society. As a political science student, state is organized power. 
and power always has an intrinsic propensity of getting centralized, getting uh, alienated. How an organized power, uh, organized force, uh, you know, would uh, transform the society? But the trust that the makers of, of the constitution uh, had in 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 this uh, you know const I mean in this document that it would contribute because it has it gave an idea of India. What I provide, you know, in the preamble, in the directive principles, so they have given us an idea of you don't need to go anywhere to have uh, what type of India we want, what, what is our idea of India. I think constitution is fair enough. It can be one of the very important uh, documents to see that what type of India we should do. Article 38, Article 39, Article 38 says reduce inequalities in income, status, opportunities and facilities. And Article 39 says that the means of production should not be monopolized, should not be concentrated in few hands, and the wealth should uh, subserve common good, which wealth should not become detrimental to the common good. Uh, this is how it has been, uh, you know, I mean, shaped. So they, they are very clear what type of India we want. And when uh, my students keep on asking, sir, what is your idea of India? When Gagarin mentioned, since I have been doing this with my students, you know, I, I always tell my students that we want an India which is economically egalitarian, politically participative, socially harmonious, culturally pluralistic and enriching, morally elevating, aesthetically pleasing, ecologically sustainable. So these are all interconnected. These are all interconnected. Now, the type of society we have to build in India. At least, you know, we, we all thought, my generation, Arna's generation, we always thought because we belong to a generation with a hope, with a great hope, you know. And as children, uh, you know, the way we used to celebrate in my village, I studied my high school in my village, and uh, the 26th January, 15th, uh, uh, this was such a festive days. We used to get up early morning, take uh, prana, uh, no, no, Prabhat Bheri, uh, and uh, around 5 o'clock in the early morning with our band, we used to go around the uh, village and say, wake up, and uh, no, say that we are Subhash, you know, a brother, we are Gandhis, you know, I mean, grandchildren, you know, Nehru's, this one, I mean, all these national leaders, today whom the present regime is appropriating, you know, see, they, they were all uh, not, uh, you know, their, you know, leaders, but, you know, they, they, they belong to the people. But then we started somewhere with some conception after freedom. And I think uh, the, the drafting of the constitution uh, almost coincided with the drafting of universal declaration of human rights. And if you look at both of them, uh, almost the they, they, they points, I mean, they, 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 they are comparable. And whatever international standards the United Nations was working, uh, I think those were the standards which were incorporated uh, in, in the Constitution of India, both in the Part 3 and Part 4 of Indian Constitution. But then, in, uh, as a political economy student, I feel that the 75 years, uh, I think, were uh, they are ups and downs, but uh, we landed uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in an India which uh, we never imagined. Uh, I don't think we ever imagined that we will land with the type of India that we are living in now. Now, the, what has happened? Where have we gone wrong? And uh, basically, my own feeling is that from 1950s and 60s, there is an idealism that uh, the generation to which some of us belong. There is an idealism. And uh, by 1960s, there was a lot of unrest because the hopes that the constitution, the hopes that the freedom struggle uh, raised among the common masses, things were not changing. The landlords were there. In my own village, there was a big landlord. Of course, this was a little benevolent, but the landlords of Karimnagar, Warangal, I mean, one can't imagine. In, in one can't imagine 1960s, uh, the one of the landlords in Janamitpalli in Karimnagar picked up a wife of a school teacher uh, and uh, raped her. And then when the school teacher went to the gadi and said, please return my wife, the landlord says she will keep. 
and he said, I have two children. He said, you are going on talking to me, arguing. And he was pushed out of the fort, I mean, that gadi. He walked into forest, picked up a gun, and mobilized 25,000 people, went to village to village, narrated his story, and 25,000 people went and attacked the landlord. When this was narrated to me, I, I just didn't know what is that anybody can do under those the police who can't dare to get into Gadi anywhere. Um, he is beyond rule of law, beyond constitutional framework. And when I, when I narrated this to the High Court judges, when I was asked by Bhopal Academy, Bihar uh, judges started sharing uh, you know, in, in uh, lunch that professor in central Bihar the situation is the same. So the, 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 the feudal relations uh, were supposed to be transformed in, a, in, a, in, a, in a independent India. And the constitution, the rulers, the regime, the police, the civil servants, all of them are supposed to stand for the poor, for the marginalized, stand against these powerful people. But somehow that qualitative change was taking, it was moving very slowly. And economy was not picking up. The economy did not pick up because we didn't go for land reform. You think of any country which has developed, first we went for land reforms. Because there's one way that you remove the dominant structures in the rural area. And then, you know, the whatever agriculture surplus we produce becomes industry. That's how development takes place. But our economy did not pick up. And unfortunately, in 1980s, the Mrs. second term, Mrs. Gandhi decided that uh, capitalist path, perhaps the only way to, to do something to make a difference to the rate of growth, and we go to financial institutions, international financial institutions. But one has to also understand that as we started becoming a part of the global market, getting integrated, the culture, culture conservative culture that Arna was referring, what Radha Krishnan said, uh, or what Baba Sahib Ambedkar said, that culture started, you know, because the rulers, you know, the particularly the political party, one political party started depending on culture. Instead of politics, instead of economics, talking about the transformation, you know, culture becomes uh, very important. And then the, the cultural resources of the country, well, they started tapping and, you know, the then Ram Bhumi and all these become political issues. So today what has happened is, that since you are not able to solve the basic uh, problems of power, concentration of power, and also not able to uh, you know, do anything about the concentration of the economy, the Article 38, 39 are put to shame. That today, what Arana was referring to the economic differences, whether you look at PKT or whether you look in the recent you know, statistics, that 1% of the people commanding 50, 56% of the, of the national income. And 40% people living on just 11 to 12%. And the, 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 the steep inequalities. Now, if you want to sustain these inequalities, the, the, you know, politically, you know, I mean, a legitimate way it will be to, to transform through progressive taxation, through, you know, I mean, uh, uh, collecting money from or uh, transferring the resources from the rich to poor. We used to have progressive taxation in 1950s. All that has gone. Now the concentrate, I mean, the entire focus of the ruling regime is how to encourage growth of wealth. That's all. Why, why wealth? What do you do with the wealth? Why should nation grow faster? What is this, you know, 10% rate of growth? What is this 5 trillion economy? I mean, they have nothing to do with people's lives. But a middle class, a self-seeking middle class has come up and this class uh, finds uh, its own interest in this growth, because you know their living conditions have been changed. You know, I, I remember when I joined as a as a lecturer, you know, in Usman University, I, I was getting three hundred. But today, when a professor, when an assistant professor joins, he gets sixty, seventy thousand. I mean, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. Our living the conditions have changed. Our lifestyles have changed, and uh, with the result, we are completely alienated from the from the poorer sections of the society. Whereas European middle classes have contributed uh, in an enormous way in building democracy, democratic institutions. Indian middle classes have become a part of the subversion of institutions. When they knew a national education policy is announced, which is obscurantist, 
which had nothing to do with social justice, which had nothing to do with the constitution. There's no resistance from the universities. They have become a party to that. So they, in other words, the type of India into which we landed is, a, is an India which we never thought uh, would be the type of India we'll be living in. Now, when you talk of the higher human values, I always say that what type of human India you think? The human India is the one where human beings enter into relationship with each other without any meta category rupturing the relationships. I enter into a relation with the other human at a human level. Okay, I'm taking all other external factors out because we are human, basically. Our identity is human. But except that, all other identities remain, but not the human identity. When I meet another human being, I look at uh, the ulti identities and I look more at the distance rather than my proximity. Now, with the result, what happens, you know, the, the relations, particularly what uh, Arna was referring to secularism, now, see, secularism, people keep on asking, what is secularism? Is the minority, uh, you know, communalism, secularism, and all that? Uh, no. I always remember a very emotional, you know, I mean, uh, incident that happened in Bombay when we were celebrating Yar Desha, it's the 75th birthday. Professor Randhir Singh was a Diana of professor from the university, came, and all of us, Bhagavad we were, you know, then, uh, by then, this debate was going on on secularism. Then Professor Randhir Singh, so, um, absolutely being extremely creative, now he said that Professor A.R. Deshai and himself participated in the armed struggle in the late 1940s. And then, of course, independence came and both of them came over ground. A.R. Deshai went to Bombay University, Randhir Singh joined uh, Delhi University. They didn't meet for almost a decade and a half. But when they met on this particular day, when they met in a seminar, uh, I believe both of them uh, were not able to talk to each other and they hugged each other and started crying for quite some time. That Randhir Singh said that when both of us hugged and started crying, what more definition do you want? So tears have that meaning. In other words, when one human being meets another, we are shy what religion he belongs, what the Randhir Singh, you know, what subject, he's a Punjabi, he's a Maharashtrian. I mean, all these things do not matter. But today, all multiple uh, you know, structures of dominance, dominance started mediating our relations. And today, secularism has become a true. What is secularism? Entering into relationship with other humans. Somebody is a Muslim. So what? I mean, he belongs to a particular you know, belief system. But how does it matter? But then the religion becomes such an identity that I am I, 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 nobody if I do not identify with my own uh, you know, religion. What has religion to do? I mean, the religion you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a is a way of life. It also gives certain moral standards and all that. But then once you identify with your religion, is it necessary that you should be hostile towards other religions? That loving other religions is not a part of your religious belief. I mean, you know, the, the, the fundamental questions are completely gone and very trivial things started, uh, you know, determining the relation. But fortunately, although about North India, I do not know much because I haven't worked with the grassroots. But as far as South India is concerned, as far as Telangana is concerned, some time back, I, we went to a village uh, we were doing this as some village surveys as a part of our, you know, I mean, committee against famine in Mahabub Nagar. And uh, we were asking the villagers, particularly Dalis, please show us five poorest families in the village. And they started discussing who are the poorest, how do you define the poorest? And somehow they discussed and all that. Then they arrived at a consensus, these five families are the poorest and they said, sir, we'll show these five families. They have taken to one family. It was a, you know, with newspaper attached to the roof and it was a, you know, very, very poor looking, it was a hut. Uh, wife and husband went for, to work in the fields. They were not there. But uh, these daddies started describing, sir, this is one of the poorest families, go sometimes starve and all that. And that was a Muslim family. But they didn't make the difference. 
the, the, the relation, the type of relation today is being ruptured. And uh, today, you know, I mean, Mahoram, for example, in my village, uh, we, we never knew that it was a morning day. We always thought it was a festival. My mother used to prepare sweets. We used to go and participate in Mahoram. I mean, it was, it was integral to our culture. But today, culture is not a you know, unifying force, but culture is uh, not even harmonizing force, not even pluralistic, but culture has become a, a, a great disruptor of the relations. So on the one hand, what is happening at the level of relationships, the, the, they are getting increasingly dehumanized and uh, the dehumanized to such an extent, not between religions, even within the, you know, I mean, uh, one religion family, I have seen recently in, in my own state, Telangana, that uh, the wife and husband, that chap is an IT professional and uh, there were, were diversities, uh, children have to stay uh, for uh, three, four days with the uh, father, three, four days. And one Sunday, this father has cut the throats of both the children and buried them in his own house. And the story came out, he's not poor, he is employed, he's not unemployed, but the human in him was lost. Recently, one mother and uh, her son uh, cut the uh, throat of a daughter and take, took a selfie. Uh, somebody cut a throat and uh, took it to police station and surrendered. What is happening? I mean, the, 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 the violence, uh, you know, I mean, uh, of the worst form. So somewhere, this is happening because somewhere the human is lost. So this is happening at, a, at an individual level because human beings are alienated. They are contacted with other human beings. So there is no communication. I mean, they do not know what is the meaning of life. They have never asked this question that what is that we live for? I mean, those philosophical questions which Radha Krishna or even Upan Shadura asked, they have gone from our consciousness. And if you look at the state and the state agencies and the political culture, I mean, the, the, the way, you know, the, the political culture shaped itself, it has nothing to do with the people. There's a big gulf between the mainstream politics and, uh, and, and the people. Now, so therefore, the idea of India, the officers, you know, like Gagarin, you know, I mean, uh, um, all of you, when you have, after your superannuation, you know, reflecting. Now, what I would like you to do that the method and the prism through which you reflect, on the society and go to the deeper uh, causes as to what is happening. Two things are happening. One is the dehuman process of dehumanization. Secondly, you know, the complete uh, rejection of a, of a vision, constitutional vision. And, you know, they would like to have Hindu Rashtra and all that. What is that Hindu Rashtra? I do not know. I mean, I, I do not understand. Uh, if you mean by Hindu Rashtra going back to Manu or going to back to uh, Kautilya, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know that what Manu spoke, and uh, it's uh, please, Mr. Uh, Gagarin, organize a lecture on uh, Manu as to I mean, what exactly he said. Uh, they need not be what exactly he wrote. And, uh, you know, he, I, somebody today is inspired by that vision. And uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, something is happening because this type of fascist culture is needed to sustain this uh, unbelievable economic inequalities. So they are using culture to sustain the uh, economic inequalities, uh, diverting the attention of the common people from the real problems. If you look at some of the surveys in UP, somebody says, I'm unemployed, I'm suffering, I'm educated, and all that. And when uh, the anchor asks, whom do you vote? And he says, I vote for the Bharti Janta Party. And why do you want to vote when you say that you are suffering from that? Then he says, you no, know, Taliban have come into power in Afghanistan. What Taliban have to do with, uh, you know, but, you know, this is how, you know, his understanding, uh, somebody says, you know, law and order has improved. Somebody says, um, they say that we are suffering. Uh, they say that they are enormous suffering. But when it comes to the political solution, they, they look to, to, a, to a politics where they have no solution to their problems, or at least they are not offering the solution to the problems. Now, the structural, you know, causes, the structural causation as to why I am suffering and where are the, the, the root causes of my structure, they are not able to relate to the structure. 
but that doesn't mean that uh, people are you know uh, completely remained ignorant in the sense no aruna knows that you know within this last 50 or 40 50 years how much of change has taken in among a lot of change has taken place and uh, they are definitely more uh, conscious but the conscious has not uh, has reached a point where they can critically connect their life experience to the structure in which they are living and that is where i teach my hope on the social movements and the the the, the function that the social movements are performing are exactly the function that the political system ought to have performed but since politics abundant almost to the people now that space you know those who are creative those who are concerned those who are uh, you know i mean uh, concerned for the future of this country now they entered that space well meaning people very committed and concerned with the human suffering you know those are the people who entered uh, into into this space and uh, there, therefore i always feel that a humane india is also in the in the womb of the present india it is in the off at this age i still feel very optimistic because i see that a woman uh, my grandmother my mother or my my you know partner and uh, my daughter if you look at the four generations the enormous change has taken place my grandmother was bought from tamil nadu for 50 rupees she didn't know where she was born she didn't know her parents but fantastic woman but then she was completely you know her life was spent only in the kitchen she used to prepare breakfast lunch you know afternoon she used to take rest my mom for o'clock something evening and then dinner and her life was completely in, in the kitchen and my grandfather was absolutely a patriarch but my father and my mother used to argue of course my wife and myself you know this mahabharata goes on but she wrote recently her autobiography i mean no that the, the, she has a critique on me i mean the, the rightly so now the, what i'm saying is this change that is taking place uh, between the man and the relation between the man and woman dalit today uh, is no longer the same dalit when we went to karimnagar and asked the dalit why your landlords are so angry and one dalit sir said the dust under his feet has fallen in his eyes it's a extremely profound poetic expression of changing relation between a dalit and the landlord children have become much more conscious of their rights students you know i mean uh, when we were student we were not a level of for teacher but when we become teachers we are afraid of for students the relations minorities definitely they are concerned the girl in a, in a, in a bangalore all alone was facing a big rowdy crowd that was the confidence of the girl I mean, the 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 whole CAA, you know, the you know, protest that has taken place in India. You know, these are all indicators that the people are asserting. And in these movements, uh, you know, I see the seed of a new society. What is the the underlying, you know, I mean, uh, essence of all these struggles is that in such a humane India, that in such a an India where they can live with dignity and self-respect. a humane india where you no know, what arna said of equality and secular uh, a humane india where people can live with self respect dignity and a meaning to life and the fuller search for a fuller meaning to life so my own conception therefore is that we we the india uh, is of course uh, what is appearing was unfolding is very frightening i mean i would say very frightening but then This, in, in this frightening experience, there is a new India is being born. And when you know in civil liberties, if we I used to have some serious differences with Dalit, you know, I mean, challenge the upper caste. Bhagwapal used to say that uh, they are challenging us. You know, I mean, it's okay, but uh, these aberrations uh, herald birth of new human values. So uh, therefore, the the, the entire process uh, through which we are going, uh, I think. Uh, in an alternate to india you know, which you know for which aruna has been working for such a long time what is that that keeps her you know so active is the is the hope is the is the confident that this yes, we will be able to create a new india and, and as you go and work with the people uh, when you see their uh, their commitment their understanding you feel more inspired uh, and you feel more reassured that uh, things are possible 
So I think this discussion that you people have started is a part of the process that reflecting on India, contemporary India, what is the alternative, where from that alternative will come, and how do we move into a more humane uh, society, politically, socially, economically, culturally, aesthetically, you know, I mean, morally, I think, uh, you know, we have to move towards a, a new India. The idea of uh, an India, an alternative India, uh, always uh, uh, has to be alive, has to be kept alive. And uh, I always tell people who are in the social movements, sometimes they, they keep on asking, sir, what do you think we have achieved? I say we remain human beings. Because of the movement, we remain human. Otherwise, we would have been dehumanized. So that is what keeps us alive. And I, I have a feeling that uh, the, although this present situation is very depressing, disgusting, but then I think in the human history, there are passing phases. I think we are passing through a phase, uh, which unfortunately we have to pass through. But uh, the, at the end of the tunnel, I see a humane India uh, is, 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 in, is, is, is in the womb, is, is in the office. Uh, this, uh, with this confidence, I you know, close this uh, presentation. Then let's see how you know, our friends react. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, uh, for your uh, uh, wonderful uh, humane talk about uh, humane India. Uh, Madam Arunar, I would like to show that video, how common citizen whom we don't consider at all, keeping the humanity alive, that video, uh, Sadi kindly play that video. हिंदुस्तान में और कुछ होना हो अच्छे कानूनों की कोई कमी नहीं हम लोगों के लिए बनाई पॉलिसीज योजनाओं को हर जगह पहुंचा पाए या नहीं पर नीतियां और योजनाएं बहुत हैं और अच्छी हैं सरकारें बदलती रहती हैं और हर सरकार बहुत सी योजनाएं और लोक सेवाएं देने का वादा करती है प्रॉब्लम और तकलीफ ये है कि ये कागज पर ही रह जाती है और एक आम हिंदुस्तानी अपने हकों के लिए दफ्तर दर दफ्तर भटकता रहता है अगर आपके पास पैसे कम हैं या आप पॉलिटिकली कनेक्टेड नहीं हैं या आप काम करवाने की क्षमता नहीं रखते तो काम खुद ब खुद नहीं होगा अहम सवाल हम सब के लिए यह है कि सरकारी कर्मचारियों और अधिकारियों और नेताओं की जनता के प्रति कोई जवाबदेही क्यों नहीं है जो काम इन्हें करना चाहिए जब ये नहीं करते हैं तो इनसे सवाल कौन पूछेगा ये जवाब किसको देंगे भारतीय जनतंत्र में जन ही सर्वोपरि होता है सबसे ऊपर माना जाता है लेकिन सच ये है कि आज जन पर तंत्र हावी है आज राजस्थान से शुरू होकर देश भर के लोग एक नए कानून की मांग कर रहे हैं वही लोग जिन्होंने देश को राइट टू इंफॉर्मेशन यानी सूचना का अधिकार दिलवाया था अब मांग है सरकारी लोगों की अकाउंटेबिलिटी या जवाबदेही की ताकि जनता जब अपने हकों को लेकर सवाल करे तो उनको जवाब तो मिले ही साथ में जो भी सरकारी कर्मचारी या अधिकारी या नेता अपना काम न करे तो उससे सवाल किया जा सके और काम न करने पर उस पर पेनल्टी हो इस कानून की मांग के लिए राजस्थान के लोग पूरे देश की ओर से एक यात्रा निकाल रहे हैं जवाबदेही यात्रा शहर शहर जाकर लोगों की शिकायतें समझ रहे हैं उनको नोट कर रहे हैं उन्हें लेकर जिला कलेक्टर तक पहुंचा रहे हैं और जवाबदेही कानून की मांग कर रहे हैं हर काम की जिसके लिए इन सरकारी लोगों को तनख्वाह मिलती है जवाबदेही होनी चाहिए अकाउंटेबिलिटी होनी चाहिए सुनने में कितना आसान लगता है पर लोगों से पूछ के देखिए कितना मुश्किल है
इसी मुश्किल को आइए आसान बनाते हैं लोकतंत्र को डेमोक्रेसी को मजबूत करते हैं लोकतंत्र जिन लोगों से बनता है उनको ऊपर उठाते हैं वक्त आ गया है एक जवाबदेही कानून बनाते हैं आप भी हिंदुस्तान में जहां भी रहते हैं अपने इलाके में सवाल उठाइए और जवाबदेही आंदोलन से जुड़िए क्योंकि सवाल बहुत हैं अब जवाब चाहिए और कल नहीं आज चाहिए नॉर्मल प्रोसेस डज नॉट वर्क even the right to information does not work then we can file an application or a petition to the department itself saying that please implement whatever you are supposed to do if they do not then the first appeal lies within the department if then also it's not then it goes to an ombudsman and then it goes to a commission just like the rti the structure is the same but in this case the there is a penalty on the official for non delivery and for not implementing what is supposed to be implemented according to the law if you ask me because because we have allowed the political bosses to define what should be done in many cases bureaucrats though knowing that something is right just don't do it and the petty bureaucracy is very difficult to move and the pressures that are brought on the petty bureaucracy are enormous so for the petty bureaucracy to function there must be the fear of answerability and accountability okay uh, ma'am uh, one more question on rti in continuation uh, sir you can also respond but uh, madam uh, uh, would like to leave in next 10 minutes so some of the few questions in initially i will be focusing on uh, uh, what are addressed to what are likely to address to madam because the uh, audience have not made such a distinction what can the helpless citizen do in the face of an active dilution of rti provisions by government operators as uh, that views it as a ma- matter of nuisance rather than a necessary citizen empowerment tool and a essay that goes along with it now can you kindly respond it? supreme court actually, supreme court that goes actually, along with the government <coughs> actually nobody in power wants to part with it that's the first and fundamental thing we have to understand and when in when i am un- unfortunately i'll tell you that harshal nai ashmandar and i when we went to the ias academy to talk to xis as xxx xis officers to ias officers they said that we had betrayed the uh, uh, our cadre and our origins by bringing in the rti because they don't want answerability and accountability in any form now the point is originally the answerability and the accountability of the ias officer was in terms of being disallowed to do so because of political power but now the meshing of vested interests of the civil service as well as the pol- political bosses are so finely interwoven that you cannot really know where one begins and the other ends so in one sense the bureaucracy is committed to implement the constitution implement the law implement the process and to make sure that what is what is eligible under the law is delivered to the people the the definition of the our rti by people as being uh, an irritant or a nuisance is the story of the people in power the story of the people who are not in power who are victims of power it's it's an important and absolutely vital tool the right to information actually it is uh, i mean i have met hundreds of people from all walks of life who have said that rti is really a way of dismembering power and i don't know if you all know but that's a subtext to my what i'm going to say that because all these campaigns are really impacting the impunity of power 
and impacting the people in power that a person like Doval, who is, my, is an ex batchmate of mine, by the way, who's a national security advisor, <laughs> said to the police academy in Hyderabad that the enemy now is not outside the borders of India, but within, and he mentioned civil society as the future enemy of, of, uh, of this republic. And the temerity of that statement is something which really takes me into another realm of wonder as to what we have produced as a, as, a as, a, as a political ideology or in the understanding of governance. If accountability, transparency makes everyone shy off the idea of a, of a republic, then there's something basically wrong. Transparency and accountability are imperative and absolutely necessary to any concept of good governance. So therefore, if you want to define it as, 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 a, as an irritant, you are the person who wants to get, a, get done with, with, with the accountability in any form. And if you demand it, then you are a person who wants access to some services which are not being given to you, though it is under the rule of law, it is a legislated law. Why are people in MG and RGA not paid their wages? Why are people not allowed? To, why, why do they don't even get their name on a master roll when they apply for work under a completely legitimate law? Or why don't they get rations? And why do people like these silicosis patients that was briefly mentioned, you know what silicosis, I don't have to explain to you. Silicosis patients who have been given money by the government of Rajasthan and by other state governments, whatever they may be, are given a lack of rupees during the time of their lifetime and four lakhs after their death. And there are middlemen who siphon off this money in connivance with the department. How can the department allow this connivance? And those people are completely on the edge of poverty, edge of ill health. Men who die at the age of 35 and 40, look 60, 65. I mean, it's the worst of humanity. We do it in our health department. We do it wherever at the cutting edge. So therefore, right to information is uh, a red flag to those who do not want to act according to the law. And accountability is worse than that for them because it fixes responsibility on the person who is not doing it. And I'm afraid without these tools, you will not be able to change what I felt was a dream of a good India through the constitution or Professor Hargopa's dream of a better India because we have to have workability, a legal structure, a moral, uh, moral structure under which we work. There are two or three questions that have been asked. I've been noting it down from the... Uh, from the chat box, which I would also like to address. What, what has not self allowed India to self-destruct? I think the constitution has not allowed us to self-destruct, basically. And because of the constitutional norms, I mean, and I don't have time and I will not take liberties with time, that you, it has not gone into it because I stopped in 18 minutes. I asked my friend to keep a stopwatch. So at 18 minutes, I stopped talking and I throttled myself midway. Likewise, I will not take too much time. But I must touch upon this, that India is not self-destructed because of the constitution and because of the initial respect we had for constitutional authority, that no matter what happened, there were fringes that were, were problematic. But by and large, we stayed within the rule of law. But now the rule of law itself is being changed. Parliament is passing law which is anti-constitution. There are so many laws that have been passed which are anti the Article 14, which is of equality, and we have not raised our voices. So that is the problem. And actually, if you say, uh, one question has been asked that what is religion and philosophy is so good and why is India like this? I would like to say that in our minds, we must differentiate between religious philosophy and religion as a humane system and organized religion. Organized religion is a political entity. Unless we recognize this, we will not go ahead. Organized religion is a political entity. It builds temples, it builds mosques, it builds gurdwaras, and from that money is earned. And there's a whole system. And I tell you today that devastanas are so rich and none of them contribute any money towards uh, well-being. Some of them do, some of them don't. But we don't have the access to uh, right to information to see how much money they have or how they spend that money. So there are huge amounts of issues because if you, once you start raising money, then you fall into a structure of accountability within a political system. Quickly, one or two more. Uh, secular India. Uh, 
is the only framework under which we will not balkanize. If we do not have the concept of a secular India, we balkanize because secularism will not only stop with one difference of religion, as it has shown, it's not only Muslim and Hindu, it's also Christians. And then it will go into the further categories. It will subjugate women. It will bring in, bring in all kinds of religious texts, which will say women should be staying at home, which is what the Manusmriti says in any case, that women should stay at home, that they should perform their function in begetting and per perpetuating larger families. It, should, or it will also subjugate even the Dalits who don't understand today in large numbers that when the, if the Manusmriti comes they're back to square one. So for all of us, it's critically important that the constitutional values remain. The constitution remains. And one more, one more uh, issue, and then I'm going to say bye-bye to you. Mm. You, have, you have asked us, uh, constitutional conduct of the civil service, when it's overridden by political biases or by pol political authority, I'm extremely shocked that IAS officers form their own clubs. I'm talking about the IAS because that's the only service I know a little bit about. They form their clubs for social events, but they don't form a unity to resist if one of their servants, fellow civil servants, is asked to do a wrong thing. Believe me, if the civil service comes together today, it can rock India. Because after all, let's understand that it's not a mean thing because politicians don't run the country. It's run by civil servants. Why don't they then form a union to protect the constitutional rights, protect probity, protect ethics, protect their own, their own uh, moral authority in what they do. And I'm afraid that we have not done it. And that's one of the reasons why we are losing to, uh, uh, to the uh, other structures that are taking over. And I wouldn't be surprised very soon if your service, as well as the IAS, is, uh, uh, is, is becomes an on-contract service, which is what this government is veering towards that the civil service is going to get smaller and smaller unless it is controlled totally by political authority. You also know that they are going to change the UPSC rules now, that the cadres will not be allotted, the cadres will not be allotted to states. They are going, the central government is going to control cadre allotments and also control the posting of people to the center and to the state. There are insidious ways in which they are trying to control uh, the lives of civil servants, and there is nothing that comes from the civil service. It's all people outside who are making a noise. And I think if the civil service itself surrenders, then who's going to support it? And I'm afraid that if there is no such voice, in, including the example that you quoted of, uh, of uh, the police officer who was victimized yeah. because he stood for the constitution. Why didn't all the police officers in Gujarat get together and say, you cannot do it to our fellow officer? Why didn't the All India Police Service get together and say, you cannot do it? They absolutely quiet because everyone to himself is the law of the, of the civil service today. And that is the reason why it's being beaten again and again. And an equal India is only achievable if we reduce inequalities. And to reduce inequalities is the only way to keep peace. And without peace, there is no future. None of the things that you want will prosper or I want will prosper without peace. So these are things we must keep in mind. And we are a secular country with a right to, to, to practice religion. That is why the constitution is such a strong constitution. The state is secular, but you and I have the liberty to be practice any religion we want, be atheist, be uh, agnostic, be a believer. We believe in many different kinds and varieties of religion. We have the choice to do so. And I think our constitution, despite its many failings, nothing is perfect, has been for India one of the most important binding probity and ethical frame which has kept us going all these days. Once we get rid of it, we are, we are doomed. And there are people who are trying to get rid of this to bring in a, 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 a theocratic India. And believe me that all of us as being another religion will suffer because it will bring in a hierarchy. The output of that hierarchy, we can't even begin to imagine how it will be. So I would plead that we keep the constitution as it is and protest against any amendment to its fundamental principles. Otherwise, we are going to live in a kind of living hell. And I think the constitution gives you the frame for compassion and fighting in civil society with, with social groupings, with caste, 
with discrimination against women, with religious uh, violence, with all that will give you the social flip side, which will promote that. But today we have the constitution on paper and a state that silently supports social, social movements that are fighting against secularism, fighting for religion and theocracy, fighting for violence, fighting for killing. And the kinds of statements that have been made in recent times in Ardwar and in Allahabad tell you that such impunity given to people like that will rock your peace and mind as, as much as, as it will of the people who are targeted. I'll end here by saying that I am wedded to one slogan and one concept and one idea, which the constitution empowers me to do, but which is a poem written by a South African poet, but by, by a slogan, uh, slogan written by a South African poet. And that I believe in absolutely. He says, what is democracy? It's talking truth to power. Making truth powerful and power truthful. And that power the constitution gives me. And since it gives me and mandates that power of mine, I will go along with the constitution for myself and the people who suffer inequality. And I thank you for indulging me and giving me these eight minutes to finish what I have to say. And I will re I apologize to Professor Anupal that I may have to leave because I have another meeting. I won't be able to hear what you said. And uh, thank you for all your wonderful ideas and your, and your presentation, which was as profound as it always is. Thank you all and thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, it is um, uh, it's a quite inspiring lecture for most of the audience. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunate that you have a quick meeting, so you are signing off. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sir, uh, we would continue with the questioning, uh, question answer sessions, uh, which Madam oh, yeah, has yeah. Uh, aside. So, uh, few questions which Madam has handled. So, I'll just uh, make them into points and then uh, seek your response. Sir. On the dilution of 40 years, sir, what is your uh, response uh, and uh, what do you think uh, we should be doing? Which one? The dilution of uh, Right to Information Act. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, the, the point is that the present government is completely opposed to the right to information. They, they are opposed to all the institutions. They are opposed to the constitutional spirit and constitutional values. But they have come to power through constitutional process. So, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, it's not on right to education, the National Human Rights Commission, UPSC, Election Commission, federalism. Look at any constitutional structure, which was so laboriously, to put it in Dr. Ambedkar's word, that which they so laboriously built and took two, two and a half year, years to write that constitution, is now being subverted. They just don't care. For example, in Telangana, Chief Minister now said that uh, you know, we have to rewrite the constitution. What is that that is coming in his way? He doesn't explain. What is that that the constitution prevented? But <clears throat> what Marx somewhere you know, made an observation that the rulers write constitutions and they extend the rights like right to information. They, they give them the rights and those rights become a problem to them because the model that they are pursuing is a negation of the rights that the constitution granted. So there is a, there is a tension between the constitutional rights, including right to information, and the uh, compulsions and the needs of the rulers, those who are in power. Now they have to help the capital for accumulation, they have to help the richest people, they have to help the powerful people constitution is opposed to that. And therefore, the, you say that constitution has become a problem. Same thing happened right to information. While they have given the right to information, it has become what Arma said is a power with the, to the people. It has become a tool and people started using it. Now, if you look at the right to information, the way they have changed the entire you know, right to information structure, the term of the people and the emoluments of the people and the qualifications of the right to information, you know, information, uh, 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 informationers, you know, you, you find that the commissioner's terms have been completely changed. 
and um, you know, Sridhar, you know, Madhubushi Sridhar, who raised this question of uh, Prime Minister's memorandum of March, you know, they, they suddenly, you know, that, uh, port that, that portfolio has been changed from him. And the commissioner, chief commissioner said that uh, this will, will not be with you. So within the commission, the chief commissioner and the commissioners, they themselves have diluted the, the process. Not only the government tried, but the commissioner themselves surrendered a large part of their power to the government. So in, uh, that's the reason why, since it has become a power to the people, and it, it, it really people started using that power, now those on power are diluting the entire structure, the process, uh, and, uh, and its uh, legal status. It has become a problem to them. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question which Madam has addressed and uh, which uh, I would also, I'd also request you to look into, sir. It is commonly believed that unlike several other newly independent countries, India did not self-destruct. Is it because what it chose not to do, then what it chose to do? So I'm the like question that, is... Uh, what, countries, I mean, what is the question? I mean, uh, Question is, India did not self-destruct is uh, the statement made by the uh, person who is asking the question. And uh, the question is, is it because that uh, is it in the, the, it in the sense of self-destruction did not happen because what it chose not to do, then what it chose to do? No, no, I think the, uh, you know, the reason why democracy uh, survived uh, for Seven, 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 unlike many other third world countries uh, where uh, democracy collapsed. Uh, see, we are, we are a very complex society. For example, I uh, used to give lectures to the Indian Army. And in my informal chat, uh, I used to ask them, uh, <clears throat> did it ever occur in the Army or you know, the, the, the taking over you know, the country and all that? Nothing <laughs> very friendly. They said that uh, army cannot manage this country. Just the country is so complex that the, this this can't. This was not the you know understanding of the armies in several countries which have taken over the power. So the army has come to power in number of countries, but Indian army is very careful. It's also relatively more enlightened also in, in one sense. So therefore, and the Jawaharlal Nehru also made quite a bit of difference. You know, if you look at Nehru's own self-reflection, he says that he has a dictatorial tendency. And, uh, you know, I mean, given uh, the opportunity, Nehru would play, Nehru would become a dictator. Himself said that. And R.K. Lakshman, uh, when he was giving a lecture in Ambedkar um, uh, Open University in Hyderabad, uh, Lakshman said that when, he, when Nehru met him, in some meeting, he said, Lakshman, your cartoons are not very harsh on me. Be more harsh. Because, you know, somebody has to regulate, somebody has to tame my power. See, this was the enlightened, you know, leadership. We were privileged at the time of independence. So, they built institutions over a period of time. Now, after 75 years, as I mentioned in my lecture, uh, the economic inequalities have completely grown. The focus of the country shifted from social justice to the growth. And uh, now the power, most powerful, economically powerful have come to corporate world is controlling the state and the state has become a corporate state. And uh, <clears throat> now the real threat to the constitution, to democracy, to the rights, the Prime Minister himself said that human rights weaken the society. Actually, the human rights, actually the essence of democracy, they strengthen the democracy. But you know, now they, they, are, they all started saying that human rights have weakened. And even the UN, UGC chairman went on arguing with me. No, 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 no. Now we, duties are more important than rights. Because the Dalits started asserting rights. Sadhivasi started asserting the rights. Women started asserting rights. And those who are privileged, now they feel that the rights have become a threat. And therefore they are saying, no, no, there should be more emphasis on the duties than on the rights. So I think you know, the, the context is changing. But because of the complexity, because of the multi-class nature of the society, multi-caste nature of the society, complexity of Nagaland, Kerala, Kashmir, I mean, you know, such a complex society, 
that I think you know what to do or what they decided to do or what they decided not to do is not determined only by them but by the structure. But the logic of economic development uh, started changing. That is where the danger to the to to democracy lies. You know, in the in the inequalities, growing inequalities. I see the threat to democracy. Thank you very much, sir. That's quite a good elaboration. Uh, <clears throat> there are two related questions, sir. How old is the idea of India as a modern nation state? Did it precede British India, or was it formed during British rule, or was it after India won its independence? Related question to this is, sir, how different is the concept of idea of India uh, uh, in comparison what I, RSS ideologues think vis-a-vis uh, the uh, founders of the constitution, uh, Nehru, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, or for that matter, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's thoughts on that subject, on that issue. Sir. Look, uh, there, there are the historically, see the culturally there is a conception of India from the olden days, Bharata Varshi, Bharata Kandi. You know, I mean, this type of, type of things are there um, as a, as a cultural notion. But when it comes to the political entity, what you call nation state, then uh, you know that uh, you know, when after independence of 560 states, uh, the provinces had to be merged. They were all independent. For example, Hyderabad state had its own you know, currency, it, it had its own uh, army, or it, it had its own entity. Uh, and you know, they have ruled after the Kutub Jai, you know, when Nizam, you know, these uh, have come. No, they, they were completely different uh, regime. So this princess have, were state. They were the state. Now when all of them were merged, and you know, when uh, you formed you know, the, what you call the you know, Indian Union, I think only from 1950, 1947, the idea of India, although Gandhi freedom struggle had you know, um, some notion of India, but if you go to Northeast, they say they were never a part of India. I mean, you know, they never, you know, in the, in the past, till 1950, 1947, they were not a part of India. In 1947, when we got independence, Hyderabad has not celebrated freedom because it was not a part of independent India. Only in 48, it, uh, September, you know, it became a part of India. So nation state is the 77th year old. This modern nation state is only is, uh, after the partition, that too, one part of India has gone. And uh, uh, so therefore, nation state is very young. But nation, a uh, notion of nation is there for a long time, but the notion of political state has not been there for a long time. When nation and the state they combined, that's from the for the last uh, after the constitution was adopted. Till then, I don't think that we had a nation state. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, about the conception of RSS as a uh, in India as a nation state and uh, uh, yeah, the broader yeah. conception the, uh, of RSS has an advantage. Advantage is they rooted their notion of state in culture, Hindu, you know, I mean, Hinduism. That has a commonality. Because, you know, the, whether the Ramanuja Acharya, Shankara Acharya, these people also established Mathas, you know, centers in different parts of India, Ganges, uh, always, you know, I mean, uh, considered even in South India as a part of a very holy river, and you know, all these things, notions were there. But, that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, that cultural notion which they think, because of the culture, they completely look at the political and economic solution in the culture. As uh, Aruna said, that uh, religion is different from organized religion. As a personal faith, people can believe and practice uh, their religion in the home. And that's how the European nations have grown. And the state and religion fought in, a, in, in the Western context. And the science and the religion fought. There was so many people who sacrificed their lives, you know, scientists, uh, against the religion. And the religion fought the state. And the state fought the religion and therefore it became autonomous from the religion. And therefore, you know, it, 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 the secular idea has come. So therefore, the, in India, the, this entire route and you know, RSS forgets the entire European history, our entire evolution of India as a nation state. And uh, it also forgets that this is a highly hierarchical authoritarian structure. And they want the, the structure to perpetuate because they enjoy the privileges, because they represent the top Brahminical class. 
I mean, a Brahminical ideology. And they, therefore, completely, it's not even Hinduism. If you see the Hindu view of life of Radha Krishna, what uh, Arna was quoting from Radha Krishna, our Gagarin was also saying, you know, if you look at Radha Krishna's notion, Hindu view of life is so different. And uh, Dr. Ambedkar was one of the first to deconstruct the whole Hinduism. And then, you know, he has started critiquing from the most ancient period because he thought that's the only way modern nation state can be built by critiquing the entire cultural traditions. And therefore, on Upanishads, on Bhagavad Gita, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Rama, Krishna, and Manu, see, Ambedkar provided a very powerful you know, cultural critique. But the, the point is that in Hinduism or in the Brahminism, one of the qualities of Brahminism is it quarks. That's what Didi Kosambi said, that how Hinduism, you know, co-ops others. And the minute they came to power, they co-opted Ambedkar. And they say Ambedkar belongs to us. And uh, therefore, you know, they are celebrating, you know, uh, Ambedkar, this one. They don't like Ambedkar, but now they think that Ambedkar has become a, a, a force to reckon with and without recognizing Ambedkar, their power will not be legitimate and therefore they admire Ambedkar. They admire Gandhi. They, you know, Gandhi has been killed by that ideology, but they own Gandhi. They own Ambedkar. But they disown Nehru. But see, they look at this, you know, the, the way they have co-opted two very powerful symbols. And now the Subhash Chandra Bose. Subhash Bose was opposed to the RSS and the, that ideology. All those who oppose their ideology but have a public respect Gradually, they are assimilating them. They, they, are, they all belong to Sardar Patel, for example. Patel banned the RSS. But now they think that no, Patel is their hero. <laughs> so the, the, the entire strategy of RSS is to co-opt some of the symbols because they don't have freedom symbol because they didn't participate in the freedom struggle. And uh, they want this privileged Brahminical uh, class of the Brahminism should be restored. And we should go back to pre-Muslim you know, Muslim state. British, they are not critical. They are critical of the Muslim, Mughal period. And they want to go to pre-Mughal period. How is it possible? History may move slowly, but history always moves forward. You can't go back to slavery. Is it possible to go back to slavery? History can't be reverted. So the what all that attempt they are making is to revert the back to the you know pre-Mughal uh, Hindu India, which is historically not possible. But for the time being, because of the enormous division among the people and highly hierarchical society, I think they are able to electorally, you know, I mean, manage uh, the, the system. But I don't think that what happened in Calcutta by West Bengal, although, you know, the campaign was, but West Bengal identity was there. There are so many multiple identities. There is no only Hindu identity within Hindu. There are multiple identities. So therefore, there is a serious problem. There is a serious problem. But they are trying to hammer out and uh, somehow bring some loose, uh, you know, I mean, connection and then consolidate their power. And therefore, they are rejecting Constitution of India. Um, uh, Ravi, you should know that uh, four years back, the Hindu outfits, Hindutva outfits met in Goa, three days conference. First day, they said, we are rejecting constitution of India in the evening. Second day, they said, we are rejecting democracy. And third day, we want Hindu Rashtra. Democracy and constitution, these are alien concepts. They are not rooted in Indian culture, Indian tradition. They are borrowed from the West. Therefore, they should be rejected. This is their stand. Is it really possible to reject constitution of India, to reject democracy, and to have a medieval you know, governance historically? You know, where are they? But for the time being, that uh, because of that uh, long uh, tradition of culture, as I said, that the, as a cultural tradition has been a lot of cultural memory, they are for the time being and, uh, you know, able to succeed. And they are able to also divert the people from the real day-to-day -day life problems, employment, poverty, inequalities, you know, suffering, health, education. From these serious problems, they are able to divert to the attention to trivial problems and to cultural you know, domain. From a real political economic domain, they are trying to shift the issues into the cultural domain and they are bringing culture in a big way as an explanation or as a source of power rather than 
the economic and the political problems. Thank you very much, sir. We have a lot of questions, but I'm not sure uh, we are already into one and a half hour, one hour 50 minutes of the webinar uh, that we have uh, uh, spent now. And uh, audience is there, but so, sir. Uh, next question is on uh, the uh, ancient uh, thoughts of Indian concepts, whether uh, in Vedas or other uh, medium. So, Veda uh, question, uh, sir. Question: Veda contains ideals such as all life is imbued imbued with uh, Paramatma. However, to many, India does not appear to be humane and and fraternal society. How do you explain this? So the same continuation Veda. of the same question. Uh, I, I'll uh, combine one more question with this, sir, so that you can uh, both answer both of them together. Satsangs, yoga classes, etc., teach ideals like uh, ahimsa, love wall, serve wall, etc. Yet there seems to be a lot of venom in India. How can this dichotomy be explained? So yeah. can you kindly answer? No, see, the uh, Vedas, Upanishads, uh, you know, even Ramayana, Mahabharata, as uh, Marx himself says, that the classics, classics represent the childhood of mankind. They are fascinating because they represent the earliest childhood of mankind. Oedipus, you know, some of those classics, you know, they are fascinating. You know. And uh, uh, they, therefore, they have an appeal. Ramayana, what you call the epic predicament, you know, Ramayana even today, uh, you know every bit of Ramayana, but uh, people keep on uh, watching Ramayana or people keep on watching Mahabharata. So therefore, that is a nascent life and in Upanishads, uh, you know, some of the questions which you were referring to, the certain, some of the fundamental questions, what is the meaning of life, where from human beings have come, who is running this world? After death, what happens? Those questions are relevant even today. They are unanswered questions. These are the questions raised by the earliest nascent human history. Nascent human being still has not seen you know, the, the, this world. But we have seen now thousands of years of history. We have an advantage because we are standing at a point when we have a long historical memory. But they didn't have that memory. The first interface with the nature make them to ask certain questions. Those questions remain, but those answers are not relevant. That's what, uh, so therefore, questions uh, keep on uh, raising. And uh, we, can, we can still go back and see that what questions they raise. But the type of answer they gave are the questions that answers which would not be relevant to the present times. So that's how you have to critique. And that's why Dr. Ambedkar went into the Upanishads and Ramayana, Mahabharata, Manu, he went because you to, if you have to provide a cultural critique, first you have to read these classics and then interact and then construct a modern notion of culture. That perhaps he was the only, you know, I mean, philosopher in modern India who has gone into the nitty gritties of the cultural structure and then provided a modern critique of the culture and wanted to provide an alternative culture and constitution was one of the means through which he tried to uh, convey the modern ideas and modern notion of power, structure, legitimacy, sovereignty, uh, liberty, equality, all these fraternity, you know, these values which are modern, he built into the constitution, which are negation of our entire cultural traditions. Thank you very much, sir. There's one more question uh, continuing on uh, Dr. Ambedkar's dreams. Uh, nowadays, the secular word is being spelled as secular and any person uh, speaking against uh, is or called uh, uh, urban Naxalites. What should one do to realize Baba Sahib the dream of India as enshrined in the constitution? No, no, that's what I'm saying. See, for example, this concept of secular, a concept of democracy, concept of liberty, equality and fraternity, some of the noble human values, we have to bring them back bring them back in public discourse and explain to the people in the way they understand. Because secularism is not merely has anything to do with the state and religion. Secularism, as I said, is a relationship between human and human at a human level. We are human. Basic of, 
our identities were human. We belong to human species. And when I see other human being, my interaction should be he belongs to my species. We, we belong to the same you know, category. But the other identities which have come as a part of historical development should give in to that human identity. And uh, the, uh, unless you bring them, secondly, the rupture that is taking place between different groups, the violence and you know, the type of killings that are going on, are all because your human identity has gone. And you know, the one species, no, they don't kill their own species. If you look at other species, they don't kill their own you know, members. But the human being is the only fellow who kills his own spe you know, member of his species. So therefore, somewhere we have to go into philosophical, historical, psychological, you know, sociological questions and explain the Baba Sahib's concepts in the modern world. Unfortunately, um, Ravi, one of the problems is that even in the Dalit movement, or those of us who uh, have been, you know, I mean, in, in the movements, many of us have not read uh, Baba Sahib's original writings. We have not read. If you really read Baba Sahib's you know, writings, you know, his, his volumes, he has written all literally and everything. And to absorb, to assimilate what Baba Sahib stood for. And if you really rooted in his philosophy, in his historical understanding, his critique of the culture, then you will be able to uh, talk to the common people and you will be able to communicate much better what is that he stands for. And uh, uh, unfortunately, have, he was not taught to our generation at all. And the later, no, but what is that they are teaching? You know, they are, now they, they want to teach some of the very trivial things and not really Baba Sahib's essence. The reservation, Baba Sahib means reservations. You know, Baba Sahib is not confined to reservation. Baba Sahib is a comprehensive philosopher. He is a, he's a great, you know, thinker. I mean, this you will forget. And Baba Sahib, you no know, reservation, he thought, was one way of reducing or equalizing opportunities. But that his concern was equality. <laughs> equalizing opportunities, he was concerned was equality. His concern was liberty, fraternity, living together, justice, nationalization of land. <laughs> and then he, he, he stood for a totally new India. I think he has to be explained in his comprehensive sense and reservations as a tool of equalizing opportunities is one idea that he has given. Of course, I mean, it has, it did help and it has thrown up a number of people, you know, I mean, into services and all that. And uh, today, the lists have voices because of the reservations. Some idea of, you know, I mean, the justice, some notion of justice. There are so many voices. These voices would have been missing if only there were no reservations. So that is, no, it is a positive contribution is there. But that's not the only contribution of Dr. Ambedkar. His contribution, the constitution of India, the higher human values. He was a student of John Devi. He was a student of law. He, he, was, a, he was a student of cultural studies. Baba Sahib is a comprehensive thinker. That I think we have to be able to explain to the common people. What is the stand that Baba Sahib had on the, on the worldview? then I think we'll be able to take him into the larger sections of the society. Thank you, sir. One more question, especially on the gender. What is the idea of gender within this idea of India? So why do you take Baba Sahib? They read the revolution and counter-revolution. In the revolution and counter-revolution, he writes about the gender question. And then he says that how Hindu women suffer particularly Brahmin women. He had a lot of sympathy for Brahmin women. Widowhood, the way they are alienated, the way they are suppressed, the ministry. He has gone into nitty gritties of the Brahmin women. And then, uh, therefore, he said that, uh, you know, only Buddha, and when uh, the Brahminical critique of Buddha was there, Buddha was not admitting people into monasteries. Uh, Baba Sahib said that, uh, you know, Buddha had a lot of respect for women. When uh, one of those, you know, I mean, uh, portresses, I'm forgetting her name, uh, uh, she invited him for a lunch, uh, for a dinner, and Baba Sahib went to her dinner. She was a court, you know, she was a Devadas. But Baba Sahib had all respect for her. So Ambedkar writes that. 
if only Buddha had reservation about women, he wouldn't have gone. So therefore, then he, he has you know, collected so much of information to build his logic. And the gender was one of his concerns. And people must know that Baba Sahib resigned for his cabinet ministry, not for Dalit cause. He resigned for the right to property for women, which includes all women. And when President of India sent it back, he argued with Nehru, we should send it second back to President because if we send the bill second time, President has no power. And therefore, the right to property bill should be passed. When Nehru said this is initial, let's not have different the President of India, then Baba Sahib as a protest resigned from the cabinet. For whom he resigned? He resigned for women. But the feminist movement of this country does not recognize that. So, therefore, gender uh, sensitivity, gender question, Baba Sahib, you know, reading will help us. But the same problem is when it comes to the unity. Now, this caste is there, there is a class, there are very rich uh, women from the rich families, the women from most affluent families. Women themselves have a false consciousness. And uh, they, 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 for example, this 30% reservation in the parliament, what happened? <laughs> now they are fighting for temple entry, not parliament entry into parliament. If you enter the parliament, you can pass the law. But from the entry into parliament, today entry into temple is from shifting the share in the political power to culture. And today, cultural question is occupying women's you know, consciousness rather than sharing the power, sharing the economy, sharing the opportunities. So, gender question has to be dealt in that sense. You know. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a question on how do we build a movement of resistance to the fake news? Such a uh, fake news, sir, fake news and uh, distortions yes. that are uh, both historical and uh, facts are being distorted. Arana should have been there when once I she invited me to talk uh, in one of her conferences. So I said that uh, now it is not only right to information, but right against misinformation. We have to also fight, not for information alone, but against misinformation. We are living in a post truth society, Satyantar Samaj, post truth society. Now, there is no the difference between falsehood and you know, reality, between truth and the false, or the truth and lies. You know, that, that line is gradually disappearing. And social media is full of lies. Um, you know. And uh, now it needs a critical mind to separate. Now look at you know, Rahul, this uh, you know, I mean, uh, Republic channel. That they, they tell lies so boldly, so correctly, and uh, so, uh, so forcefully that uh, you, you, uh, you get lost because the way he talks, <laughs> as if he is talking the truth. But you no, know, they are talking a lie. People in powerful positions they are telling lies. So the, the, the now, but one thing is that gradually people are now understand the very fact this question has come that there are fake news is the beginning of the struggle. Now, if, if there is a widespread understanding that there are lots of fake news, that these fake news have been always there, you know, the rumor, rumor mongering, for example, Ganesh drinking, you know, uh, milk, or the Skylab falling, or world is coming to an end, or floods have come, and you know, all these uh, rumors were there, people uh, really responded for Ganesh, uh, you know, this one. So, therefore, in a culture, these things were constantly sustained, this rumor mongering. And Indians are very vulnerable, very vulnerable. You know, the false information spreads faster than the truth. Because people somehow think that, you know, the, some exciting news, you know, easily pass on. <laughs> and I think gradually we have to keep on talking and educating how to look at things critically. And then I think, you know, you because after some time, falsehood, you know, people will realize, but it takes time. But it's true that we are living in a period of the fake news and uh, such a fake news, you can't even believe that such things can ever happen. But such things are happening. <laughs> 
So if they they go enforcement directed goes and attacks somebody, whether that fellow is corrupt or not, you don't know. Once the enforcement direct goes, people start believing these fellows are corrupt. It could be political, you know, vendetta. But then people are ready to believe, and that's the reason why state, you know, the people in power are using that vulnerability and spreading the false information. But the debate, the fact that you are, uh, you know, in this debate, fake news have come as one of the questions. Yeah, that means we are increasingly becoming conscious that there are a lot of fake news in circulation. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more question. This is, why do we have the contradiction of the deprived and exploited sections of society in a pitched armed struggle versus the state usually fronted by constabulary of the state security forces drawn from a similarly deprived sections of the society? So, so but to see... Power, you know, the, the constable, you know, I mean, uh, there, is a, there is a novel in Telugu and uh, it is written by a constable, his father's, uh, you know, life and his own life. And the way a constable is treated is worse than a slave, you know, by the police officers. Uh, and he wants to resign. He was working as a laborer in the village. And uh, because he became a constable, in the village patwari, you know, village heads, you know, village rich people also respect him. I mean, when he goes to the village, yeah, they, you know, he's a constable, he's in the police department, all that. But when he comes back, he's asked to do orderly job and wash the utensils and wash the children's toilet and all that. He writes that. He, this is a wretched life. As a laborer, you know, I was more dignified than this constable. But when he goes back to the village, the village respects him and then you know, he suddenly can't make out whether to be a laborer with a dignity or to be an orderly with all this indignity. But there is a little bit of power. So once you get into system, you, you are guided by the you know, internal culture of the system. And you no longer belong to the, you know, your own life. And, you know, many people forget their uh, life experiences you know, the minute you get into power. So power has that type of tendency of uh, you know the perpetuating you know or the, or the wiping out the memory. So first you it, it hits your memory, life memory. Only people like that come back. No, some people remember their childhood, remember their discrimination. Therefore, they keep on fighting for lifetime for others. But uh, most of the people, you know, some, if you see the Kailanji type of thing, you know, from the um, uh, sub inspector to so, so the superintendent of police, SP to MP, MLA, local mandal, everybody was a Dalit, but Kailanji happened. That's what Anantal Tumde has written, that all of us, you know, are there, all of us belong to the Dalit background. But when the atrocity happened on Dalits, from the top to bottom, from member of parliament to the constable, if we are not able to handle, then how, how things will change? This is a question he asked. So I think once we occupy the positions of power, Power always has the tendency of distancing you from the people. So once the officer says, be it, you know that the Dalit struggle is a right struggle. They are fighting for a real cause. All that you know. But as an officer, you know, you start <laughs> behaving exactly the way that the upper caste fellows behave. So the, the, the basic problem is that the bureaucracy, what Aruna was telling you, bureaucracy unites. If they have a common, what you call the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the common ethics or you know, the moral, ethical framework. And if the officers have that esprit de corps, what you know, France and Germany have, then any punishment to an officer for rightful thinking, the rest of the officers should stand by them. Then the politician will realize if you touch one officer, the rest of them will of them will resist. That is not happening. That's not happening. So with the result, individual officers who take their duty very seriously pay very high price. This is what happened in Gujarat. So people know very well-meaning people suffer. And the rest of the officers are silent. I know that one IS officer in uh, the combined state of Andhra Pradesh was a very honest officer, but he was suspended. He was telling me he was crying also at one point. He was telling me IS officers are coming after 11 o'clock in the night, 11.30 and saying, sir, we sympathize, but they were not willing to come in daytime because they don't want anybody to see them going and meeting him. 
He said, what happened to my colleagues? Why they can't take a stand? They know that I'm not corrupt. <laughs> so I think, you know, the gradually these things hopefully will give way because personal interest also matters you know, a lot, self-interest. Thank you very much, sir. I think we've completed all the um, questions that are there. So uh, it's time to uh, close this uh, webinar uh, uh, after such a wonderful session. Uh, I thank uh, first uh, Aruna Rai, madam, for her wonderful exposition uh, in a more forceful and inspiring uh, way uh, of what she did and what her ideas of the constitution are. And then followed by Professor Hargopal, as usual, uh, the humaneness of all uh, ventures is what he brought out and how we as humans should be interacting with each other rather than living our identities. And then followed by a lively question answers from all the audience and uh, patient response by both the speakers, especially Professor Hargopal for spending so much of time. Uh, so I thank you, sir. And I thank Madam, who is right. absent now. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it on. Keep this program. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, you know, the educate your, you know, our, you know, sensitize your colleagues. And, you know, it says a part of, you know, I mean, a lively experience for them also. You know, it is good. That otherwise, you know, people will get alienated. And, you know, you become lonely. You become solitary. This thing keeps the collective notion alive. And that's why such debates and such groups must be encouraged. Thanks for the wishes also, sir. Thanks for the wishes and we'll continue, sir. We'll also contact you to use your services for uh, various future webinars and topics and speakers. Uh, we'll also contact you, sir. And yeah. I also take this opportunity to thank the audience who have stuck with us for two hours for uh, on the YouTube uh, and asking such interesting questions. And uh, also thank uh, our technical team led by Mr. Sadi Kali for all the support that they've given us in uh, holding this webinars. So thank you very much, sir, once again uh, yeah, to bye. you and uh, yes, sir. Now we can close, sir. Thank you. <laughs>